Hi, my name is Shauna Ristic. I'm here to tell you about my near-death experience. So it happened when I was 19 years old. I was just graduated from high school and trying to figure out what it means to be a woman in the world and to create a life and was modeling and trying to figure out that whole industry and had just started working in bars because that was a way for me to make a little bit of extra cash and you know, be able to leave for go sees or for modeling experiences or whatever needed to happen. But as I was working in that life, I got a little bit disillusioned about what it means to be a woman in the world and sort of felt really disappointed by it all and decided that I was really ready to renege my contract. That I just didn't, it was hard here. People were not nice and it was, you know, just more challenging than I had felt ready for. I would never do anything like that. This was just something I said, you know, kind of out of the blue. Flash forward to Christmas Day of 1993, and I was on my way to the airport to go to a football game in another city with a client from the bar. And I had woken up in the morning on Christmas Day. I went downstairs to have our Christmas celebration. We had you know, presents and, and food and things like that. And then my family left to go to my distance family in another town. And I went back upstairs to take a nap. And when I woke up from the nap, I realized that I had overslept and it was going to be really tight getting it to the airport. But I was going to make it. I just needed to really hurry. And so I packed my bag really quick and I jumped in the car and I jumped on the highway and I remember looking down at the speedometer and I was going 75 and at that point that was 65 was the speed limit and seatbelts actually they weren't illegal at the time but I felt like for some reason I needed to wear one all the time so I put my seatbelt on and I was up and I was zooming down the highway and I thought gosh you know I need to call this guy that I'm going to the this game with and to the strip with and tell him that I'm on my way I'm just running a little bit late. This was back when cell phones were those bag phones that plugged into the cigarette lighter. So back before they fit in your pocket. Um, so I thought, gosh, you know that my cell phone's in the floorboard of my car. I need to take my seatbelt off and pick that up. And gosh, you know, I'm flying down the highway. Let me just go past this car and get over this bridge. And then I'll, I'll do all that. And so I was passed over the bridge and just past the car. So I took my seatbelt off and I bent over to pick up the car phone. And as I came up, I came close to hitting a car I was passing and I swerved to miss. And my car nosedived into the median. And then I flipped end over end across the entire median, then the other two lanes of the highway. And then I was found about 40 feet from the car, face down, turning blue. The miracle that happened was that the car right behind me was a nurse and the next car coming from the other direction was also a nurse. So there were two nurses that were immediately there and they just did what they could do to sort of put things back together and hold my airway open as best as possible. But I don't remember any of that. I was completely out of body at that point. And they ambulanced me to the town that I was living in because there was a trauma nurse or trauma doctor there who happened to be there that day. She was only there twice a month and it happened to be that day. So she could do a tracheotomy or do tubes down the nose so I didn't have to have a tracheotomy and she could stabilize me as best they could. And then they lifelighted me to Kansas City where I spent a month in a coma. That's pretty much what happened on this side. Now, what I remember is swerving to miss the car and crashing. And then the next thing that I remember is I'm opening my eyes and waking up in this amazing white lit room. It's completely bright white light. And there's these six beings standing next to me. And they're very, very tall and they're, they're like white light. They have sort of the shape of a human, and but they're kind of glowing. This beautiful, loving light just coming from them. And it was like, everything was okay. They put their hands under me and they lifted me up out of my body. And then I was standing in the room with them and I remember embracing them and just being so grateful to be with them. It was like finally home with my family, you know, like the real family, like the one who doesn't judge, and, you know, one without baggage and all that stuff that we deal with here in our human forms with families. 
And the thing that I really learned from them, and I went looking back and really sitting with this and, and describing that energy, that love, because when you say love, it, it's not love with all the attachments that we have on, in all the conditions that we have in our human sort of perspective of love. It's really like reverence. They want nothing but what's the best for us, or for, at that moment, speaking in first person, for me. They wanted what was the best for me. But not with the conditions of, you know, if I accept they're wanting the best, that they'll feel better, or, you know, with an agenda, or with any of that that we're used to when someone offers you something. It was really just like this unconditional love, this total reverence, and appreciation for what I had come to do. And they shared that with me about what I had come to do. And I understood later that, you know, really I came here to help people find their way home and remember and realize the same state that I was in at that moment. And when they look at me that way with this reverence and this total unconditional love that they're giving to me and wanting what's best for me and wanting me to succeed and wanting me to do what it is I committed to coming here to do. When I accept that and when I receive that, then that in itself is reciprocity. They, that in itself is the gratitude and the receiving that they get in return. And then they were showing me, you know, as I said, what I came to do. And I didn't remember it all at the very beginning, but over time, and especially when I, I came out of the coma, I remembered that I had come here to really help people remember who they are. And they showed me what I'd done up to this point. And at that point, I really felt how much my actions and saw but not just seeing it was like seeing like a circumstance between me and my best friend at the time but really feeling how he felt by my actions and really feeling what i had done how i had been with someone really affected them so that i understood fully my own actions, but in the ability to receive that as well. They really showed me that. And then they showed me also what would be possible from here on out. And boy, you know, I sure wish I would have had like a map laid out from that point on, but I did know that things were going to have to radically change. Everything was going to be different. And boy, was it. The next thing I remember is them showing me, you know, it was sort of a debate whether I was going to come or stay because I had said I was ready to go. And here was my options. Was I going to stay or was I going to go? And for a long time afterwards, I felt a little bitter, like I didn't have a choice in the matter. But over time, I've come to understand that it was a mutual choice between us. Was I staying or going? But at this point in my memory of what was happening, they were showing me how it's kind of like how it's all connected, how each of us is connected infinite ways to everyone else and to each other and it's like looking out of an airplane at night and you see over a city and you see all those lights on the city in the landscape and each of those lights is connected to other lights and they're all just this vast network of love and of light in kind of basking in love uh, because that's sort of the foundation of it all and if one light goes out it creates like a power surge that creates dims or completely extinguishes other lights all around it and some you know across the globe and just seeing how we're all so connected and that we don't realize how much our own light affects the entire grid of everybody around us and and so they explained that or they showed that to me as well even on a concrete personal level how me leaving would affect like my brother how he would be with women would he ever have a relationship or really get married or even be able to it would completely change his trajectory in life you know and others as well and interestingly enough what i found out later was that there were many people on this side praying for me and sending prayer grams when i came out of the coma my mother had saved all the letters that people had given me and sent, and there were hundreds of prayer grams from churches from people that i didn't even know that were putting energy out there to pull me back. You know, my family had stayed in the waiting room and kind of camped out there. And you could only see me twice a day throughout the, th those first two weeks of the coma. 
most of my family was ha camping out in the waiting room in order to just have a moment to come in and see me, but pulling me back. And I remember looking down from my, my hospital room and I saw my body in the bed, just broken and remember seeing it. And, wow. And seeing this broken body there and this sort of lifeless form. And, and I saw my mother sitting next to me and holding my hands and sort of praying. And I remember thinking, oh my God, what did I do? And then I sort of snapped out of it and went back into sort of this darkness space that I was, I was in most of the time. The last thing that I remember really was the circle of those beings. There were probably about 12 of them and they were all in a really large circle in this room. And I was amongst them and they were all debating whether I was to come or go. And like I said, for a long time, I thought I didn't really have a choice because I really remembered that circle. But over time, I've come to realize that it was a joint decision. And once that decision was made, I began to come back. It's not like the movies where when you come back, you sort of pink back into body and you're like, what did I miss? And everything's fine. It took a really long time to get back into body and to really be able to integrate back in here after going so, so far out and so far away, back with these beings that feel more like home uh, and experiencing this loving space that felt more like home. As I was coming back, I remember a moment where I was still not fully awake, but I came out of the coma for a brief moment and my friend I was sitting there and he had been staying with my family in the waiting room and he was in his turn to be in the room with me. And this was, I think, about three or four weeks after the accident. So I was still in the coma and I woke up and I remember laying there and just kind of looking at him and just willing him to wake up. Please wake up. Please wake up. Now, in the accident, I broke my chin off. So I have metal plates in my chin. Um, I had head injuries. I broke six ribs or front and back, punctured lung, back pelvis, you know, really crippled body, uh, a broken ankle and, and other things that I forget about. So at this point I couldn't speak because my, my jaw had been reconstructed. And I remember just wishing him awake and, and he woke up and he said, oh, Donna, you're awake. And I kind of mumbled something and I think he understood that I was asking what happened. And he told me, and I don't even know what he said, I don't remember that, but what I remember is the way the room felt. I remember that full pregnant potentiality, that loving fullness was here, was on this side. That fullness and that okayness and that love and that everything is as it should be and you are loved and you are okay. And we are grateful for what you're doing here. That whole feeling of support and love that I felt on the other side, it was here too. It's the foundation of this place too, of this side. And I could feel that. I could feel that in the room, just pulsating. And I remember just marveling at, it's here too. It's all that is. It's all that is. We've just been just the illusions of our day-to-day -day karmic life that we forget about what the truth is and who we are and that, that truth of who I am and that feeling of homeness and support and love that I felt on the other side it's here too and I just remember feeling that and then I couldn't hold awakeness anymore it was too much effort to stay in body and so I just sort of fell back again back into this deep deep space. And then the next thing that I really remember is there was a moment where they would strap my body into a wheelchair and wheel me to therapies. I was not in body at most of those times. I kind of have a memory of being strapped in and hating it because I felt like my body was going to slip out and they were going to run over me. And they wheeled me to PT and I kind of had a memory of at one point them holding me up and I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. I'm not even in this body. How are you going to make me walk? But what I really remember is that after that session and in the wheelchair, and I wasn't too much in body, but I remember kind of dropping into body and they're wheeling me down the hallway. And I remember seeing this person 
person coming toward us that was also in a wheelchair. And remember, as they got closer and closer, thinking, wow, what happened to that person? They are really messed up. And as it got closer and closer and closer, I realized it was a mirror. And that was me. And I thought, wow, I've really done it this time. And at that point, I snapped right back out of body and didn't remember a whole lot after that. And from that point on, you know, I didn't really, I don't really remember a whole lot uh, until they transferred me to the neurological hospital. And I dropped in to the body once they gave me a hot bath. That was just the way that my body would, had always relaxed. And once there, that happened, I started really coming back in more and more and more. And then further down, the line, as I healed and got out of the hospital, they told my parents to expect me to be in the hospital, the neurological hospital. So I was in the coma and in the intensive care unit for about a month. And then they transferred me to a neurological hospital and said I'd be there for four to six months. And I, they should not expect me to live on my own or be able to go back to school or be independent. But I did it in four weeks and I was out on my own. And within a few months, I was living on my own again and going back to school. But at some point after all I'd been through, you know, and I coming back after that, it's like being totally blasted open. It's like we all have our light inside us, this beauty that we are, that I really dropped into and became aware of there and saw that in these beings as well. And they have very much emphasized that I am like them. And so are you. But over time, after coming back and really working hard and having all those filters kind of blasted off and being purely in that love space and seeing nothing but the light in other people. I mean, you can see it in each other's eyes. And I remember that I could really see that, but I didn't have the capacity to notice the shadows that might influence how they're going to behave or react to me. And so I often would get hurt or taken advantage of or manipulated. And, and that was sort of a challenge for me. At the same time, it was so challenging to see the hurtful things that we do to each other. And I really was struggling with that. And so I went into a bit of a depression and started having thoughts about, you know, maybe I was wrong about coming back. Maybe this is I'm feeling a little bitter because I felt like I was didn't have a choice in the matter, but I couldn't end it. I mean, that was really bad. I mean, after all we've gone through bringing me back, I couldn't like disappoint all those people now. And I started journaling and I would just write and write and all these thoughts and all of this, these questions would start coming out and coming out and coming out. And after a while, I kind of go into a trance, just sort of regurgitating mental stuff. Then when I would read it later, I would notice that something had started to respond. Something was answering my questions and it had happened through my hand, but it was not my voice. And that's when I started communicating with that council that I had met on the other side while I'm on this side. And they have become huge confidants for me, huge supporters and have helped me in my path. And I really wondered, you know, I know I came here to help people find their way home. I know I want people to know what I discovered on the other side about this love is the foundation of it all. And we are all this beauty inside. Just step into it and love it, you know, and this reverence and reciprocity, you know, it doesn't have to be so much baggage. I mean, I knew I wanted to do that, but I had no idea how to do that. And then in my journaling, they started explaining to me how to notice when things open you. So when you drop into that truth of self, we call this intuition and there's plenty of people out there want to tell you it's not true, but when you drop into that truth of you, and it's not up here in the mind and pushing forward and thinking about it, it happens more when we sort of fall back in that relaxed state and we drop into ourselves, into our own essence. Then you can notice when something really resonates with you and it is the right path for you, it expands you and it draws you to it. And when it's not the right path for you, it contracts you and sort of pushes you away. And they explained this to me. So I started playing with that. And, you know, I was kind of going through this, well, how do I find my way? And then lo and behold, once I surrendered to it, things started lining up. And I met a woman who was a massage therapist, which at that time I didn't even know that was a valid profession. And she had a lot in common with me. And I asked her, I said, you know, I'm, I had this experience and I'm, I don't know what to do about it. And I, I don't know why I'm depressed all the time. I'm so unhappy. I'm working in this job at this restaurant. And 
I'm supposed to, you know, I'm, I'm doing just fine. I have everything I'm supposed to want. I've got a decent car. I've got a good boyfriend. I've got a, I've got, you know, this good job. And this was maybe two years after the accident. So well, why am I miserable? And she said, well, maybe you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? And she suggested, well, go check out this massage school. And I went there. And as soon as I walked in, it was like, ah, it opened. And it was like, yes, this is it. And that started my path into doing healing work. And it's been quite a ride. And I'm so grateful to share this with you and to be at a place where I can remind you of who you are and hopefully help you find a little bit of why you came to and find your way home.